Hi, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to be here today. I want to thank uh, Fondação Merrier and uh, Instituto de Medicina Tropical, University of São Paulo, for the opportunity to be here sharing uh, some of our knowledge with you, our students uh, that are participating in the course. So I will speak on uh, basic concepts on PCR and real-time PCR, which is uh, nowadays the standard, the gold standard for the diagnosis of uh, arboviruses. So why uh, do we use PCR for diagnosis? So uh, I think that the main reason we use PCR is due to the analytical sensitivity. So we don't have so far any other methodology that uh, can detect so uh, small amounts of any analyte. And when we see an analyte here, of course, we are referring to what PCR is able to detect, meaning either DNA or RNA, but nucleic acids. And so the method is able to detect nucleic acids at a very low uh, level and uh, not, not uh, equal by any other methodology before. And so I think this is the main reason we use, we like to use PCR. Second point in the field of uh, infectious agents, infectious diseases, is because there are several organisms that uh, don't grow in culture. And so you are unable to culture them and then uh, you have to rely on a method that uh, is able to detect and uh, does, doesn't need to uh, have uh, any, grow, any growth. Uh, and also growing is, uh, I would say, all outdated method for routine diagnosis because it's expensive, it takes time, and it's cumbersome. It's, it requires a lot of work and infrastructure, whereas uh, PCR is much faster, and this is the third point I'm, I'm listing here, and uh, easier and, of course, cheaper. And also a fourth uh, important uh, feature of uh, PCR is its uh, versatility, meaning that you can do PCR basically uh, starting from any kind of uh, biological material. Not only biological material, we use PCR for uh, crimes, for instance, crime, crimes investigation, where you try to recover very tiny amounts of uh, nucleic acids in, in objects like doors and cars and computers and so on. And so basically you can do concerning uh, medical diagnostics uh, from blood or from urine or from feces or for, from uh, nasopharyngeal swabs, saliva, any kind of biological sample uh, that you can recover DNA, can recover RNA. It's uh, use, useful for doing PCR including paraffin embedded tissue, which is also another important source of uh, material for diagnosis. So uh, with all these uh, positive uh, features, uh, PCR slowly became the gold standard uh, for infectious diseases. I would say now it's the main uh, technology adopted in infectious disease labs, uh, to, uh, along uh, serology, of course, but um, in, in several instances, uh, PCR is more advantageous than, uh, than serology. And the general procedure for any PCR, it will follow this. First, you have to extract, then you amplify, and then you detect. It always has to be done in this uh, order of flow, and uh, somehow you can uh, combine some uh, still on or so on of these steps here, but also. It's, uh, it requires this order of, uh, of uh, action uh, due to the characteristics of the method. So we're going to discuss this uh, after. In the, okay, so extraction first. What does it mean, extract? Extract means that you want to purify the nucleic acid from the sample. So it seems to be very, very straightforward, but it's important for us to ask, why do we need to extract? This is the first question I always uh, make to the students in my classes if they have thought about why do we need to extract? Because um, several uh, methodologies that we use in the lab, I would take uh, serology as an example, as a parallel comparison, you do not extract. So you can use raw sera, raw plasma, the antibodies are there, and you don't need to extract the antibodies out of the sera, the plasma, the, the whole blood. So why do we need to extract the nucleic acid if we want to run PCR? And the reason for that is that 
Here, of course, is a electron microscopy that you can see. These are two cells here, side by side, the nucleus, the cytoplasm, the membrane here, mitochondria, as you can see here, and, and the Golgi complex here. And of course, the DNA is mostly here. We, there are some other um, more uh, technical uh, particularities when you want to have the DNA from uh, outside the nucleus. But in general, you want to get the, this DNA that's in here. If it's a virus, then it could be the cytoplasm and it could be also uh, out of the cell. But if you, even though it's still valid that you, you want to extract the nucleic acid, and extract means basically to remove everything and to be just with the pure DNA. Not only the, all the membranes and the lipids and that are around here, but also proteins that are tightly bound to the DNA, which if they uh, remain there, they won't uh, let the reagents to get access to the DNA and then you, you can't have amplification. And also, not only that, it's a, so the idea of extracting is to have pure nucleic acid, but also to remove uh, many substances that may act as inhibitors of the enzyme of the TAC polymerase or the reverse transcriptase if you are doing RT-PCR. So one of them uh, we recognize very well is the M group that's present in the hemoglobin. So uh, blood, uh, if you want to do PCR from blood, you always have to remove the red cells, remove as much uh, hemoglobin as possible because this is classic inhibitor of the TAC polymerase. Or urea, for instance, urine is not a very good fluid to do PCR because urea is very uh, intense inhibitor, strong inhibitor of the TAC polymerase. So removing the inhibitors and removing whatever is physically uh, uh, bound to the DNA are the main uh, reasons we do extraction. And there are several uh, different methods to do uh, nucleic acid extraction. Uh, in general, it follows this here. First, we, the, according to the material that you are working with, uh, you have to do a mechanic uh, disruption, like if you're working with seeds or a tissue that is uh, really uh, uh, rich on uh, on uh, matrix, then you have to disrupt that to release the cells. And then uh, you go to a second step of enzymatic digestion where, for instance, we use, in general, very uh, broad, um, broad acting uh, pr proteases and that may digest any protein that is present in the sample. And then uh, after so after mechanic, you have this enzymatic digestion. The idea is to release the cells, to break the membrane, to release the nucleic acid that's inside the cell. And then you go to a, a third step of removing whatever uh, you don't want to, whatever is not nucleic acid, and uh, remaining with the DNA, RNA. And then uh, you wash it and you get a final solution that should contain pure as much as pure as possible DNA, RNA. So uh, there are several extraction methods, as I mentioned it, and you can work with very simple ones, like the most simple one that we have is boiling. When you boil, uh, you, of course, disrupt the cell and uh, you release its content. So samples that have a very low content of matrix, fibers, minerals, for, for instance, uh, uh, cerebrospinal, cerebrospinal fluid, or cervical scrapes or nasopharyngeal swabs, you can uh, work with very uh, simple methods like just boiling. This is, for instance, this is uh, in the picture here. It's uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, blood stain that you can take from the finger prick. And uh, you can just have a, a, a piece of this uh, dry blood and put it directly into the PCR tube for running, for instance, paternity tests. So this is done exactly like this. So DNA is kind of attached to the paper and it's uh, good enough uh, to provide DNA that uh, works for this uh, important test, a paternity test. Then you have methods that uh, rely on organic extraction. So the membranes, the, the lipids are removed uh, through the use of uh, strong solvents. And so you do, again, you do the proteolysis and then this uh, lysed tissue 
you submit it to uh, solvents like phenol, chloroform, or isotheosinate, guanidine, and then you will have two phases, as you can, can see here in the photo. The, of course, the organic phase stays uh, below, and the aqueous phase stay uh, upside. And then in this uh, phase here, you will have the DNA. And then in a second step, you kind of precipitate the DNA out of the solution. So what you can see here is the pure, pure DNA. And then you just uh, uh, solubilize it again in another in a buffer, for instance, and then it's ready to go. Sorry. And then we have uh, the methods that are, I would say, used in more than 90% of the labs and in the diagnosis, uh, which are based on silica columns. So silica is a positively charged uh, uh, salt, and uh, it that has the characteristic of uh, binding to uh, DNA due to charge interaction. So manufacturers have uh, developed very well done and uh, particles of silica in small columns. And when you come with this uh, lysis, lysis tissue, lysis cell suspension, you throw it in the column, then uh, the DNA will bind to the silica. And uh, whatever is not uh, bound to the silica will uh, flow through the column. And then you can just throw away remain with the DNA in the column and then just wash and by changing the buffer and the charges, it will finally elute, meaning that we will release the DNA and we will get it in a pure uh, solution uh, with a buffer. And so these uh, methods are available in uh, for manual extraction in micro columns like this, uh, uh, the one that you're seeing here, always uh, in, par in use of a micro centrifuge. So this is done, all the steps are done through microcentrifugation. And also it may be present in very large automated systems. So what do we expect after we extract? There is a, a, a constant that is well known for a long time that uh, if you read the DNA at uh, 260 nanometers in the spectrophotometer, then uh, one uh, unit of uh, uh, optical density will correspond to a solution containing 50 micrograms per mole of double strand DNA or 32 of single strand DNA and 40 of single stranded RNA. And so you, then you are able to quantify how much DNA you could obtain from your sample. And also, if you can uh, read at uh, 280 nanometers in the spectrophotometer. Photometer, uh, the rate 260 to 280 is expected to be higher than 1.8 because if it's lower than that, means that you still have a lot of uh, proteins and other impurities in your preparation. So it's not good for, for downstream uh, analysis. We in the past used it to check the DNA after extraction. Nowadays, nowadays this is so uh, well standardized that no one does it. But uh, just for uh, learning, it's, uh, it's very illustrative if you can see these pictures here. So we expect after doing DNA extraction, if you run in an electrophoresis in a gel, we will have high uh, molecular weight DNA, very high molecular weight DNA. Of course, it's broken because during the other procedures, you break the DNA all the time, but you still have very large fragments, a kind of one uh, sized band uh, of a uh, large molecular weight, high molecular weight, sorry. And if you have uh, smears like this, means that you have fragments of all sizes, meaning that the DNA was degraded, either before you extracted or during the extraction process here. So this one here, or this one here, is uh, considered a bad, uh, bad uh, pattern of uh, the extracted DNA. And here you can see what's very interesting, the DNA seems to be shattered at, uh, um, and, and providing fragments of a specific size, multiples of uh, 200, 200 base pairs. And this is what you find when you work with uh, apoptotic DNA. So apoptosis, you have this uh, kind of programmed cell death and DNA is fragmented in uh, multiples of uh, 200 base pairs. So it's, this is what you see here. And for RNA, in fact, uh, what we can see by staining in a lithophoresis gel 
is the ribosome RNA because this is the most abundant RNA we have in our cells. And you cannot see the messenger RNA, which is in general what we are interested in, is either bar RNA or in our case, or mRNA. And, uh, but we use uh, the state, the, the observation of a ribosomal RNA as a, as a proxy, as a surrogate marker of the quality of the mRNA or tRNA, including tRNA if you want to work with tRNA. And so uh, eukaryotic cells uh, have two uh, bands corresponding to two different fragments of a ribosome. One is called 18S, the other one is called 28S. There is another one called 5.8S. It's less uh, visible here in the gel. But if you see this picture here with the three uh, pieces of RNA, uh, ribosome RNA, then you know that your preparation is good. And there are uh, automated methods that you don't see this, but you put it in the uh, spectrophotometer again, and it measures these uh, fragments here, these fractions. And now uh, we have evolved to automated extraction platforms of all sizes and uh, throughputs. So you can have so, some that are very small that you process eight samples per run or six samples per run. Some that are middle sized. This one is for 24. We used to have this one in the lab here. And then you have these 96 uh, samples per run, 96 samples per run, and this very large one, which not only uh, does the extraction, but also does the PCR setup here. So it's uh, kind of um, another uh, level of automation in the PCR process. And uh, I want to, to uh, pinpoint that there is still a, a, a a weak uh, weakness of the extraction platforms because uh, if we extract, we collect from the patient in between five and ten ml of whole blood, but we just extract from 100 microliters to 200 microliters, and then from what we extract, we uh, in, uh, input into the PCR method something that corresponds to 0 0.1, 0 0.01 to 0 0.005 microliters of from the whole blood. So we extract much more than we need. And uh, this is why, uh, because we don't have still the nanotechnology uh, automated, so uh, able to handle very small volumes as the, does uh, required in, in the PCR. So PCR works with small volumes but extraction still requires much larger volumes. Well, amplification, and then uh, the second step, so after you, you extract, you have uh, to mix all the reagents that we're gonna go through uh, in a moment here with the, the DNA or the RNA. And this is what you see in this hand here. We have eight tubes containing a solution, of, I suppose about 100 microliters, where DNA is mixed to the reagents, and then this should be taken to the uh, thermocycler for the cycling, which is uh, the main uh, typical uh, aspect of the PCR reaction. So the PCR reaction, polymerized chain reaction, it was uh, conceived by Kerr Mullis, uh, and he was a, a chemist, a chemistry, and uh, a chemist, sorry, and uh, working in California at that time in uh, one of the few biotechnology companies that uh, there, there were in California at this time, there was in California at this time. And uh, he really had uh, the idea of PCR, the conception of PCR as a kind of a dream and took him like more than one year to prove the, his concept. And his concept uh, was finally uh, shown by him and colleagues there in the Citrus Corporation at that time, and uh, published the demonstration of the, cap of the amplification uh, possibility of this uh, chemical reaction, was uh, proven and, and published in 1985 on science by amplifying uh, sickle cell disease uh, gene, so the beta globin gene that uh, is mutated in the sickle cell disease. And he got the Nobel Prize in uh, Chemistry Nobel Prize in 1993 due to this uh, really wonderful uh, invention, which clearly shaped the future. So it shaped the future of all biological science, agriculture, 
uh, veterinary and medicine has changed uh, due to uh, his discovery of the polymerase chain reaction. The PCR uses one of them together with the DNA, uh, the structure of the DNA uh, are the two most important, uh, in my opinion, uh, discoveries, inventions in the uh, 20th century. And the essential components of a, a PCR are first, thermostable DNA polymerase. So here I have to uh, uh, highlight that when uh, Kerry Mullis uh, invented the, the PCR reaction, he uh, was not, uh, he didn't think on uh, using a thermostable DNA polymerase. So he was using uh, the DNA polymerase from bacteria that was available in the lab as a extract, raw extract of bacteria. And uh, this uh, led him to the need of, uh, after each cycle, because you have to raise the temperature to 95 degrees, the, the enzyme was degraded. So he had to add more and more and more and more at each cycle. So this made the, the reaction completely in, uh, complex and not practical for standard or routine use. And then there were these colleagues at, uh, at Citus that had this idea of trying to find uh, thermostable DNA polymerase where, where you would have any kind of life living in high temperatures. And this uh, idea prove, was proven to be correct. They were able to isolate a thermostable DNA polymerase from a, a bacteria called Thermos aquaticus which uh, lives in the hot springs uh, near California in the Yellowstone Park. And so they could purify from this bacteria a thermostable DNA polymerase. And that then you didn't need to add uh, um, DNA, uh, DNA polymerase or whole bacteria extract at each cycle. So once you close the tube, you could go through all the cycles and then open the tube just at the end of the process. So this is one of the uh, uh, innovations added to the PCR that made it possible to uh, leave it from, a, so to move from a, a, a research method to a, a standard diagnosis method. In addition to the thermostable DNA polymerase, you have to add oligonucleotides, which are very important, and we're going to see it, uh, why it's so important. And these are our essential components. And then the, the, the oxynucleotides. The deoxynucleotides are the bricks from which the DNA polymerase uses to make the new DNA. The template DNA, of course, has to be in there. And this will be copied thousands and millions of times during uh, the cycles. So to make it more uh, under understandable, uh, I think this uh, draw is uh, very good, this drawing because it shows here. Here you have the template DNA, one strand and the other strand. So to be here, like open like this, you have to hit. When you hit the double strand, we have the uh, hydrogen bonds broken, and then it will open. And when it's open, and because it's, it's uh, uh, free of uh, proteins, as I mentioned, during the extraction process, you have uh, the possibility of the primers, which are those oligonucleotides of about 20 nucleotides synthetic, synthetically uh, um, oh, synthesized by, by just pure chemistry. Um, you have them able to find in this DNA, in the whole DNA, a complementarity. And when it, it finds its complementary strand, which means exactly when it's able to, again, uh, 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 bind to, anneal and bind to, and uh, make the hydrogen bonds again, so it will bind. And uh, this is only possible to take place at lower temperatures. So you heat, then you lower the temperature to allow the primers to anneal, make the hydrogen bonds, and then you increase the temperature not so much to about 70 degrees, is with the temperature that uh, this uh, thermostable tag, uh, tag polymerase has higher activity, polymerase activity. And so it takes use of this three line here that is free and it starts to copy this template here and this template here by extending the three line 
uh, uh, end of the oligonucleotide. And it uses, of course, the, the template DNA as the template to add nucleotides that are complementary to this strand here. So to add an A, a here, an A here, a G, a G, an A, and so on. And exactly the same here. So you have this in the first cycle. And then by doing, uh, sorry, yeah, by doing, uh, here you can see the primers in pink and green. So you have, after the first cycle here, you will have one fragment that it starts with a new primer that was given to the reaction in the tube that was extended. And then this is to the other strand, the same process here. And then you will end up by doing this repeated, uh, repeatedly with these small fragments that have in one uh, end one of the primers and in the other end the other the other primer and the distance between them is the size of the fragment that you're going to copy and amplify so many times so how do you define the primer and the distance in in principle you can use uh, any any region of the rna or the dna to be copied it uh, has you have to uh, evaluate some uh, biochemical properties that uh, nowadays it's just by uh, you can use uh, online for free uh, programs that do this analysis for you and give you gives you a suggestion of uh, the best oligonucleotides to be used in a PCR reaction. So, but more or less, it's like this: you have to place one oligonucleotide in in one strand, the other oligonucleotide in the other strand of the DNA. The distance between them is what is going to be copied here. So. It depends if you are interested in some positions in, inside here, or it's just a diagnostic. So if it amplifies, it's positive. If it doesn't, it's negative. And uh, there are some uh, constraints also on the size we are able to copy in the, in the PCR reaction. And this amplifier DNA, as I showed you here, this fragment, it's called the amplicon. So if the, the reaction is working, with 100% of efficacy, no loss during the cycles, you will have a, ma a mathematical calculation. If you start with one copy of, uh, of, uh, of the target, then at the end of 20 cycles, you have 1 million. And at the end of the 40 cycles, you're going to have billion, a billion copies of this original fragment here. So this shows the potential uh, the, of amplification of this method. And that's why it became so useful for us, it's just for diagnosis, but for all the uh, technological processes, it's the, just the, the beginning of the process. Then you can use this to sequence, you can use this to build a, to, to, yeah, as a vaccine, a DNA vaccine, or to transform our organisms to produce a transgenic uh, uh, crop, and so on. Because then you have uh, a lot of DNA of the fragment you want in your hands, and you can use it in different, in different, by different uh, methodologies and purposes. So finally, we have the, the last step, which is the detection. And detection means that you want to observe whether you amplify it or you didn't amplify a fragment. For us in the diagnostics, again, it's the same, it's yes or no. If it does amplify, it means that the virus was there. If it doesn't, the virus was not there. And in the beginning, we were using this uh, kind of methodology. So you would run uh, your, uh, your PCR reaction in a gel, and then you have a ladder here, and you knew because of the design of the primers that the distance uh, was like, let's say, 280 base pairs. So if the same, in the sample you find this is strong band of 280 base pairs, you call it positive. So here we have, for instance, four positive samples. This method was uh, used uh, a lot in the beginning, but the problem is that, first of all, we uh, had to work with uh, stains that uh, are potentially mutagenic because they stain DNA, meaning that they bind double-stranded DNA and they may interfere with uh, double-stranded DNA. So it's a bit dangerous for the user. So it's not something that we, we would like to work and uh, also to the environment, like etidium bromide is the main uh, stain that was used at that time. And it's toxic, it's mutagenic, and so uh, it was not uh, very uh, ecologically uh, correct uh, res residue that you produce. 
and and then uh, you could use also this fragment here to to submit it to to restriction fragment land polymorphism. This is was is a method RFLP is not used anymore or not much in use, but it's the use of uh, restriction enzymes to cut DNA in specific fragments, and this would allow you to, for instance, this would be an amplification of human papillomavirus, and then you could type the HPV, the genotype of the HPV you could obtain by using restriction fragments from seven uh, restriction and enzymes. And then further, uh, we move it to this format of detection, what we call real-time PCR, that we're going to discuss uh, in a moment. Or you can use this fragment of DNA to hybridize to probes in, for instance, a nitrocellulose strip. And then if the DNA is bound at this point here where it contains a probe, then you can produce a, colorimet a colorimetric reaction and identify, for instance, again here, which type of HPV was present in this amplified DNA. But all the um, PCR methods are based in two uh, very simple principles, denaturation and hybridization. So if you think on a, a double-stranded DNA, this is complementary, as you can see, denaturation is open here. And uh, we have several ways of opening the double strand to breaking the double strand. Agents that do break the double strand are called denatur denaturing agents, like formamide and so many other, and these are in general toxic uh, 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 substances. But you can use heat, which is not toxic, and also submitting the DNA to streams of pH also opens the double strand. Uh, but uh, for the PCR, we use, of course, heat because it's reversible. And then you hope to allow the primer to bind. As you can see, the primer sequence is exactly the sequence of the complementary strand here, but a shorter fragment. And then uh, a consequence is that if you have what we call a mismatch, meaning that the primer is unable to bind perfectly to the template, it won't bind, and so you won't produce uh, 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 an amplification, the proper amplification, meaning that the primer has to be absolutely uh, complementary to the to or equal to the complementary strand. And the main uh, Achilles heel of the PCR reaction is its uh, the generate is also its strand. So the, the number one uh, feature I told you is the sensitivity. And uh, this is achieved by the amplification technology. But also, when you amplify and you produce millions of amplicons, they can work exactly as the template DNA that you put at the beginning of the reaction. So if you allow, for some reason or error or mistake, this amplicon to go back into the setup of the reaction or to contaminate the samples, you will have false positives all the time. And this is very, very common to happen, or was in the past, because if you think of one tube of PCR containing 100 microliters, uh, and you throw it after the amplification, you throw it in this swimming pool here, Olympic swimming pool, all the water in this swimming pool, we'll contain 4,000 molecules per mole of this swimming pool here, meaning the environment around would also be contaminated in the aerosol. And so you can uh, imagine the potential to have uh, false positives, to generate false positives due to amplicon contamination. This is the most concerning uh, problem for any PCR lab, and it's not uncommon up, until to, uh, up to date to have a uh, false positive due to PCR contamination. It's still happening, and a lot of effort is, is, is uh, given in order to control and to avoid uh, this problem. But anyone that is performing PCR has always to take all the control measures that I'm going to discuss here, and to have in mind when analyzing results, this is always a possibility. So one of the main uh, um, how would I say that the main measure measurements or measures that shall be observed is the workflow. So as I mentioned, it, it's good to have the three uh, steps of the PCR reaction as we discussed it in three different rooms. So in one room you extract, in the second room or under a, a 
lamina flow, you do the, the, the setup, meaning that you add the DNA, extract the DNA to the reagents. And then in a third room, you do amplification and detection. So this would be called the dirty room because it does contain a lot of, uh, of the amplified material is where amplification takes place. So the real-time equipments, the PCR equipment shall be placed in here and never you should allow any flow of uh, te technicians or objects from this room to these two rooms because you can bring the amplicon from here to here or to here and then you're gonna have a lot of problems of false positives. So lab code should be dedicated to each room, pens, and notebooks. And uh, nowadays, it's very important to not to use cell phones here because, of course, you're going to contaminate the cell phone. And uh, by using it here or in here, your gloves, your hand will be contaminated with amplicons because the air there contains amplicons. And then you can bring it back. So this is the, I would say, is the number one rule and is the where we fail a lot is to comply with these uh, simple rules to avoid amplicon carryover is the word we use carryover when you carry the amplicon to uh, where where it should not be and uh, to cope with that there are several ways to organize the lab but in general you would like to use in these two labs uh, uh, negative pressure so meaning because you don't want anything to come in so sorry positive pressure because you don't want anything to come in and here negative pressure because you don't want the air to go out so this is the idea here is to have uh, this kind of organization in the lab sometimes it's possible to to fuse these two uh, rooms here and have one single room and the setup is done in the in a corner of this room here in, inside the laminar a laminar hood but uh, of course you cannot do all the three steps in the same room. And uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, the consequence is to have false positives. And because this is so important and, and there are so heavy uh, uh, consequences, but uh, to, uh, it may have to a false positive diagnosis. Can we imagine a false positive of HIV? What can uh, make to uh, a subject? Um, because of that, uh, there are several developments uh, allowing to control amplicons and to avoid false positives. One of very ingenious strategy is, uh, is picture it here, frame it in here. You can see to your right is to the use of DUTP. As you know, DUTP is used in nature just for RNA. So RNA does contain A, C, G, and U, and DNA contains A, C, G, and T. So T in the DNA and U in the RNA. But in vitro, if you provide A, C, G, and U in during the PCR, the TAC polymerase will take U in, in, in to replace T. And so the consequence is that you're gonna have in your amplicon will be labeled with U's wherever a, a T position was needed, a U was inserted. And this does not exist in nature. And then, fortunately, you have this enzyme called UMG. This enzyme is uh, will digest G DNA containing U. Okay, so if you put this at the beginning of the process, in the in the case you have uh, amplicons labeled with U, they will be degraded, and it does not interfere with the the real amplification you would like to have because either a virus or the DNA would never contain you in the DNA or in the cDNA. And so it's kind of a prevention measure that you can use in every cycle and in every PCR is just by using UTP instead of TTP and also adding the UNG enzyme. This is a, a, one of the strategies, chemical control of the amplicon and it's incorporated into any kits. You may even not be aware that it's in there, but it's in there. And uh, also, you, it's a very uh, 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 recommended to use hypochloride sodium bleach in the amplicon room, in the dirty room, in, uh, also in all, all, all places where you have the, the touch of the human hand. So hands are the main uh, uh, vehicle through which we carry. Uh, amplicons 
and then by just using bleach you destroy the amplicons and you make uh, you keep the environment uh, clean and avoid such problems another way to do the physical control is to use uv lights so uv light is very good in destroying the amplicons and uh, it's used a lot and because it's, you have the option to use it, for instance, here in the in the in your right here, you can see a, a, a cabin, a PCR cabin, and inside this cabin is of course where we don't want to have any amplicon. So if for some reason the amplicons come here through uh, the human hand or carryover or through aerosol. When you turn on the UV, you destroy it for you use it, leave it uh, on for a few minutes, and you destroy it, and you have then a clean amplicon-free environment here, which is and, and allows you now to open the reagent tubes and the DNA tubes and assemble them here in a very clean uh, environment. Uh, and of course, uh, because this course is on uh, on uh, arboviruses. Most arboviruses are flaviviruses, and uh, flaviviruses are flaviviridae family. It's RNA, uh, con uh, gen uh, genome, it contains RNA as its uh, genome. The PCR is a DNA amplification method. So if you want to investigate RNA of any kind, you first have to convert your RNA into uh, cDNA, and then use this cDNA to do PCR. You can do this in, uh, by, by two ways. One is what we call one step is mostly used in diagnosis because it's very practical. You put all the ingredients in, all together in the tube and then uh, you first uh, provide the temperature that is good for the reverse, reverse transcriptase to make your mRNA or viral RNA into cDNA. Then you heat it to destroy the reverse transcriptase and the mRNA template. And then uh, you, you will go into the PCR, but it looks like as a just a one step reaction. Or you can do first your reverse transcriptase and then just uh, uh, add the cDNA, the, uh, complete, the finalized cDNA into the PCR too. There are advantages and disadvantages in, in both methods. So uh, here we are talking about the different possibilities of uh, RT-PCR, reverse transcription PCR targets. So we are talking about RNA targets. So the most common use is for the studies that involve uh, the evaluation of mRNA expression. Then we have uh, what is uh, closer to our uh, field, the diagnosis of viruses, RNA viruses, of course. Then the much less uh, studied uh, ribosomal or tr uh, transport RNAs, and finally, more recently, the study of uh, microRNAs became more and more popular. So being all these targets, RNA, it's necessary to first make uh, what we call a cDNA, a complementary DNA, because PCR is unable to deal with RNA, to amplify RNA. So you always have to convert first your RNA into DNA, and then you can follow with amplification. Um, in general, this can be done in two steps. So one step to convert MR or the RNA into cDNA, and then uh, you just uh, uh, add the cDNA to the PCR, like uh, uh, any other DNA. Or you can do it in one single step. There are several reagents now available to do it in one single step. And uh, either because you have both enzymes in the same tube, or by the use of an enzyme like uh, Thermos thermophilus polymerase. This enzyme has been uh, discovered uh, much more recently and uh, has the interesting feature of uh, dual activity. So it does have RT activity and uh, DNA synthesis activity as well. So it's just one enzyme that can do both and this has been incorporated into many uh, one-step uh, uh, kits. And there are also uh, other amplification uh, methods that uh, do not amplify DNA, but have RNA as the amplifi amplified molecule. So for instance, transcription mediated amplification does what exactly the name suggests. It does amplification through transcription. So you have an RNA target, 
again, you have to do the cDNA, and then, but then you use, instead of a DNA polymerase, you use an RNA polymerase, and, does, and you do thousands, millions of RNA transcripts. And these RNA transcripts are, again, converted into cDNA. So it's a, also a, a continuous cycling, uh, and it's done at the room temperature, or 37 degrees, because it's a temperature that uh, transcriptase and polymerase uh, prefer. And uh, the advantage of such pro uh, pro uh, process is because the target you generate, the amplicon, let's put it this way, it's RNA, then it's much uh, uh, more prone to degradation, to environmental degradation, so less prone to contamination uh, when compared to PCR DNA amplicons, because those are much more stable um, uh, out of the two. So, uh, uh, again, an another possibility of uh, PCR is the multiplex PCR. So, uh, investigators uh, started to want to add different targets to the same PCR for different reasons, to analyze, for instance, several genes, how they are expressed all together, or, in our case, to be able to detect uh, three or four or five flavivirus uh, in the same tube, like for a syndromic diagnostic. In here, what you can see, uh, we can see uh, the amplification of five targets, or 10, or 15, or 20, and more than 20 targets altogether. And so this is extremely useful. And now we have learned it's you can amplify like thousands of uh, amplicons altogether in the same PCR if you uh, standardize well. So this led in the field of uh, infectious diseases. Uh, to what is now called the syndromic diagnostic, meaning that you don't have to raise a priori uh, diagnostic hypothesis, but uh, to simply to test the sample from a symptomatic patient, from a, from a syndrome like meningocephalitis or gastrointestinal uh, symptoms, and then you just collect the sample and test for several agents altogether and let uh, the instrument tell you which uh, of the agents is causing that, that symptoms. So, for instance, here we show for respiratory agents. So, if you have uh, uh, any kind of uh, respiratory syndrome, and then you can test for all these viruses and three bacteria that are able to cause pneumonia all at the same time. And of course, now these uh, kits have been uh, also, uh, in the SARS CoV 2 has been included in such kits. Another interesting uh, possibility for PCR is what's called the rapid random amplification of polymorphic DNA. It's a very different methodology that you explore the polymorphism of the, of the, the subjects that you want to, to investigate, and you amplify them using random primers. So just one primer, uh, and that is able to kind of randomly bind all over the genome in, in both uh, sense and antisense strands, and it produces a pattern, like you see here. This pattern, uh, it doesn't matter exactly what has been amplified, but the pattern of amplification is typical from the strain, lineage, variant, individual. And then the closer the patterns are, the more similar genetically we are talking about. So these, for instance, are different strains of uh, potato, and then uh, you use them to, to understand which ones are more related, so they are expected to have similar biological characteristics as well, or the ones, the characteristics we want to select. And this is used for many different reasons, but it's a kind of a finger fingerprint that's very easy to produce, and uh, it's a very uh, interesting tool to compare uh, organisms, individuals, uh, at the level that you want. Finally, we have uh, moved it to long PCR, so first, we were able to amplify maximum um, 800 to 1,000 base pairs. And by uh, improving the enzymes and all the biochemical reactions that take place in the PCR, nowadays we are able to, to do much longer uh, PCR products, like uh, 40K, as is shown there. And uh, so this is, uh, for us uh, virologists, it's quite interesting because it's uh, feasible to amplify the whole genome of a virus, of a dengue virus, for instance, here or hepatitis C, uh, at once. And then you can use that to sequence, for instance, it's very uh, practical and useful. 
Finally, the real-time PCR. So the real-time PCR is uh, um, a development that was possible because also incorporated the development of uh, cameras, for instance, so very small, tiny cameras that we have in our cell phones. Similar ones are there in the instrument, and these cameras are taking photos, capturing the fluorescence at each PCR cycle. So you have to you have to have this all these 96 cameras uh, above the the plate, and the um, the plate is able to the fluorescence that the plate uh, the emission of the fluorescence is captured by these cameras. And of course, the fluorescence that is generated is proportional to in the initial amount of template and the amplicons that are produced during each uh, cycle. And then uh, you it, you make this into a quantitative uh, method. So this uh, picture is to explain why uh, standard PCR or traditional PCR that is more or less uh, has been abandoned nowadays is not quantitative, but it's very illustrative. I think it's interesting. And here you find a, a 10 times dilution of an initial uh, plasma sample with hepatitis B. So it's, this is a raw sample, 1 to 10, 1 to 100, 1 to 10,000, and so on. And uh, by just analyzing the gel, you cannot tell which one has more virus. So here you can see a 10,000 difference in the viral, viral concentration. You are unable to tell uh, that this one has uh, more or less virus than this one, and so on. So that why is that? Because in the uh, standard PCR, you analyze uh, the product at the end of the process. So meaning in here at the plateau phase. So PCR, uh, after the 40 cycles, you have a kind of exhaustion of the reaction. So even if you have uh, all the ingredients uh, and enough ingredients, abundant ingredients, it, it doesn't matter. The reaction will kind of uh, fade at the end of uh, the 40, 40 cycle. So what is this uh, figure here is comparing uh, samples with different concentrations, initial uh, concentrations, and uh, at the end of the process, they uh, achieve the plateau. So you are not, uh, they have the same amount of PCR products produ produced at this point here. So in order to really distinguish the different in concentrations, you have to analyze it in this phase of, uh, of the reaction meaning uh, when the curves are generated and not at the plateau like you do for, for endpoint PCR. So that's why in this phase here, it does have a relationship between fluorescence and the amount of template, the initial template, but not at this step here. So like the 1 billion copies here, the red uh, dots is similar or equal to uh, this uh, much lower concentration, uh, 10 to the 5. So there is a 10,000 difference that you are unable to tell exactly how you, how you see in the left uh, figure. And uh, well, how, how is this connection made into, uh, from the amplicon to the fluorescence uh, that is, is uh, produced by the reaction? So the easiest way to connect those two things, uh, and of course this is what is measured by the real-time machine, is to use uh, intercalant uh, fluorescence dyes like cyber green. So cyber green will only bind to double-stranded DNA and, fluor in, and fluoresce uh, upon, of course, UV light uh, illumination after uh, when it's bound to double-stranded DNA. So uh, you just uh, give it to the PCR reaction and you just measure at the annealing step and all the products that are produced, of course, will be fluorescent. So this is the easiest way, uh, and also it provides an additional feature, which is very interesting, is that what we call the melting curve. So the melting curve is then after the end of the 40 cycle of amplification, and you, uh, um, you hit the, the sample, and then you wait to, to the, this, uh, uh, control it, the decrease in the temperature, on the thermal cycle, of course, and you measure the forces point by point. The point where you have 50% of the products double-stranded and 50% of the products single-stranded that is associated with a temperature. This is the typical melting value and is specific for the amplicon you have produced. And it's a way to 
uh, have uh, the, to learn if what you have amplified is really the amplicon you want uh, to wanted to amplify that, that you were targeting or uh, artifacts that we know are uh, happening during PCR. If you have like primer dimers, this is a very short compared to your amplicon, and they will have a melting curve much, much uh, of much lower temperature value, so to the left. And this is a way of uh, using a cyber green, very simple method, but uh, adding some specificity to the amplification and the analysis. And the most popular one is the, uh, the detection through hydrolysis probes, have been named Tachman system also. Tachman is a, a joke uh, with the Pac-Man. Pac-Man was a, a video game, very popular when I was young. And uh, it was a, a kind of a monster that was eating uh, some small balls. And here is an analogy done with the uh, enzyme during the polymerization, when the enzyme uh, during the PCR, if you have, in addition to the primers, a probe that is bound to the amplicon in the interval, in the fragment in between prime, the forward and the reverse primer, then this probe we will anneal to and bind to like a primer. And then when uh, the DNA polymerase is, is making the, the strand, uh, the new strand, using the, the primer as the hanging tree line uh, end, from the tree line end is extending the primer, it will meet this probe bound here and we will have, uh, we will remove it. It has a exonuclease activity, the, the DNA polymerase, duct polymerase. And when removing it, it will cut this, the reporter dye. And so the reporter that was not fluorescent because it was too close to the quencher, will now uh, get uh, out of the control of the quencher and then will uh, fluoresce. fluoresce. So uh, here you have a, a way of uh, producing fluorescence proportional to the, to the product being generated, but also with an additional level of specificity, which is provided by the probe. And there are several uh, modifications of this approach. So the Tachman probe is one uh, uh, approach. This one works with two different uh, uh, probes instead of one. And uh, uh, the system is that uh, it's called FRET, fluorescence resonance energy transfer. So you excite one molecule that is one, in one probe, and this will transfer this excitement to the, another uh, dye that will uh, fluoresce. fluoresce. And, 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 and this will only happen when they are very close together. So it allows you to, for instance, to investigate single base pair mutations. The machines are several models of uh, real-time PCR machines and with si different sizes and these machines have been evolving, many manufacturers, but all work by the same way. It's a thermocycler, regular thermocycler, coupled with a detection system uh, containing the cameras. And nowadays we have uh, reached uh, such a development in PCR that became, I would say, the mainframe of uh, diagnostic in different areas like cancer, for instance, like uh, infectious diseases. So the systems have uh, followed this uh, development and now we have uh, fully automated PCR systems that you put, like the user to have for serology, that you have, you, you put the sample on one side, you get the result on the other side, and uh, what goes on in, in there is PCR, but you cannot see, you cannot follow, and uh, completely controlled by the, the, the system. Another interesting uh, variation of uh, PCR is called a digital PCR. This is, um, uh, takes uh, profit of the uh, preparation with uh, emotion, meaning that you kind of uh, partition the samples in vesicles lipid vesicles, and in each vesicle is supposed to contain one uh, template molecule only. And then you uh, amplify this in solution, and then you analyze, and uh, you can, so you do thousands of PCRs, and then the proportion of positives and negatives should uh, resemble or should uh, refer to the initial amount of, uh, of uh, that template. It could be a mutated DNA, it could be an infectious agent as well. 
And so this is always done in, in, in kind of a, an array of, uh, of uh, PCR uh, vesicles that are produced during the preparation of, of the sample. And this is kind of absolute quantification that you can have. So the proportion here of red and black uh, circles will, uh, will give us the data, the information on the quantitation of the templates in the, in the original sample. And uh, also miniaturization, so the, uh, the technology of uh, nano, the nanotechnology now is allowing for uh, the production of devices that are able to do PCR in very small uh, volumes and small, uh, and therefore in very small uh, machines. So these are the, I would say, the first generation of point of care molecular systems. You can see here some of them, we have one, two, three, four different point of care systems these are, are very small machines very small footprints you can move it easily and uh, and because in general uh, this is just a reader and uh, and uh, can be a thermocycler as well but all the chemistry is in the cartridge and you mix the sample with the cartridge you put it there in the equipment and it will do extraction amplification and detection at once and then uh, give the result so these are very useful in the different situations that uh, very fast diagnosis is required. Like for instance, nowadays in SARS-CoV-2 and influenza and to have the therapeutic decisions, tuberculosis as well. So these uh, machines are more and more uh, used. Uh, in general, they have the disadvantage of being more expensive and also less uh, 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 the throughput is much lower, of course, you can do just a few samples uh, per day here, so it's not uh, applicable to, uh, to large throughput uh, demands. And uh, we are moving more and more to smaller and smaller devices, and uh, so we can uh, expect in the future to have a kind of personal PCR uh, methods or personal, uh, this can be done in pharmacies and, and other uh, public uh, spaces and uh, contributing to that is always that is also the development of uh, technologies that enhance and mag magnify the diagnostic uh, uh, sign of the diagnostic sign by using different approaches one of them is CRISPR so CRISPR you, everybody knows is the technology a uh, technology of the, the manipulation of the genome but it's also it also can be used to specifically amplify or detect an amplicon. And then this is used to uh, uh, be able to detect uh, a virus, for instance, at very, very, very small amounts. So it, 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 the, the sensitivity is improved for orders of magnitude. And then uh, it is also can be used to, um, to, to field applications, so to point of care applications where the, the production of the amplicon is connected to some uh, uh, somehow the production of a, a band, a color, a stain, and then uh, you can use it at a point of care. Well, um, whatever is the, we have a specific uh, characteristic or I would say a, a specific demand in the arbovirus, the diagnostic world, is that in general, no one is much interested in diagnosing arboviruses, or it never made a very strong case to the large uh, molecular biology companies, diagnostic companies. So in general, we develop our own assets. We work at, with LDTs, lab developer tests, and this has the problem of the performance will be related to the quality of the lab. So. Uh, one of the features or one of the things that is uh, recommended for uh, checking for your performance is to participate in external quality assessment programs. And this is one, for instance, uh, done for Zika during the Zika crisis here in Brazil. So here you have several labs that participated in that. This, uh, they had received a blinded panel of 12 samples, sorry, 15 samples. No, no, 12 samples, 15 labs, yes. These four samples had uh, Zika virus at different uh, copy numbers, and this had odd other uh, flavivirus non-Zika. So you can see here, there are plenty of uh, false negatives and plenty of false positives. 
And we all know what's the impact of a false negative and a false positive diagnosis of Zika virus. And these uh, labs here are public health labs that are performing for routine for the public the molecular diagnostic of Zika. So it's a warning of uh, the need to improve uh, because it should be like this. So four labs performed perfectly, but the other labs didn't. And uh, this is very important. Uh, the same can apply to yellow fever, for instance, another quality assessment uh, program found a lot of false positives and false negatives by labs that are in, uh, entitled and uh, the reference labs in their countries as uh, territories. And, and so this is really worrisome. Um, of course, the, the diagnosis of flaviviruses is, is always based on the, the RNA from the virus. And you can choose among all the, the, the genes that are in there and you, you should choose and uh, uh, the genes that are more conservative among flaviviruses. So, for instance, if you want to do a, a, a Zika diagnosis, you want to focus in the, the gene that is less conservative among G Zika isolates, but it is also very deep divergent in between Zika and other flaviviruses, always to avoid cross reaction. So, these studies were done, and it, it's possible to know the, the uh, homology and the between those viruses, you can see here, for instance, um, Zika is mostly related to West Nile, very, very close to dengue as well. It's almost about the same uh, genetic distance and so on. And then you can go that, uh, there to the, the, um, the genomic level and find where those viruses are closer and where they are uh, different and try to place your primers and probes in the most, uh, in the wisest way. This is an example of a very useful PCR that was described, described in 2017 that would be able to discriminate in between the vaccine yellow fever virus and the wild type virus that was uh, the strains that was, were causing uh, epidemics here in Brazil. So they did that by evaluating the genome of both strains and trying to have primers and probes that could distinguish in between them. And uh, you can include them in the same assay by using different uh, fluorophores in the, for the different uh, assays. And so the assay would uh, tell you if you have, uh, if uh, someone develops symptoms, if this could be related to the vaccine or to the, to the virus that was circulating and causing disease at the time. And it may seem that uh, these are rare cases, but it, it was very important for, uh, for some of those cases that took place in, in vaccinated people. Because if you are going to vaccinate to block the yellow fever expansion, means that you're going to the areas where the virus is present. And then uh, you have, as you all know, there are adverse events because this is a uh, uh, attenuated virus able to replicate. And in some cases, it does replicate and cause a yellow fever-like disease in the patient. So it's very important to distinguish this, those uh, two situations. Um, the fluid of detection is also something very important. So for Zika, for instance, uh, there was a long debate on what kind of uh, biological samples should be used. And uh, at the end, it was discovered that auto simi is very rich in Zika in infected males and, uh, and further sexual transmission was uh, proven. And uh, of course, it was uh, um, it was, it is important uh, for the epidemiological situation, uh, the spread by uh, sexual contact. And this was kind of new for any flavivirus. So it's a typical feature of the Zika virus. With this, I think I conclude my presentation on the PCR and uh, related methods and its uh, applications for the diagnosis of uh, arboviruses. Thank you very much for your attention.